hesitated. May I ask why you felt little Tiffany deserved to die? Well, she was the only one that actually seemed dangerous at the time, sir. How'd you come to that conclusion? Well, first I was going to pop this guy hanging from the street light, and then I realized, you know, he's just working out. And how would I feel if somebody come running in the gym, bust me in my ass while I'm on a treadmill? Then I saw this uh, snarling beast guy, and I noticed he had a tissue in his hand. I realized, you know, he's not snarling. He's sneezing. You know, ain't no real threat there. Then I saw a little Tiffany. I'm thinking, you know, eight-year-old white girl, middle of the ghetto, bunch of monsters, this time of night with quantum physics books. She about to start some shit, Zed. She's about eight years old. Those books are way too advanced for her. If you ask me, I say she's up to something. And to be honest, I'd appreciate it if you eased up off my back about it. All right, awesome. So the first thing I want to do is make sure you take out a piece of paper. Uh, this is going to be beneficial for just the rest of the presentation, writing down any notes, uh, anything that you're thinking about, and something I want to focus on right now. So you take out your piece of paper. I want you to write down the word bias. Once you write down the word bias, the questions I want you to ask yourself as we're going through sort of learning more about what the words and the terms are, are any biases that you think you personally hold. And then I want you to think about any situations or experiences that you think that people have put a bias on you or any, any time that you think that you've experienced that yourself. So we're going to jump right into another quick activity to get you thinking a little bit more on this mindset. I want you to think about what do good leaders look like to you in your mind when you see pictures in a magazine, if you're watching the news, or if you're looking at people on TV, um, you see pictures anywhere. What do you look at when you see and define good leaders? I'm going to show you a couple pictures and I want you to just think about the first thoughts that come to your mind when you see some of these images. All right, so some initial thoughts. Does anybody have any initial thoughts of these pictures right off the bat when they first see them? You can just type it into the chat window. We'll see how well this live chat. Okay. Strong, best at what they do. Marissa, why do you say that they're the best at what they do? What, what indicators from the photos alone give you that? give you that impression. Courage, okay. Okay, this is interesting because a lot of you are going towards um, attributes to their personality based on their photos, right? Very interesting. Okay, so let's go to another example, knowing that they dominate. Okay, so knowing things about them already. Good. All right, so when you see the second line of photos, right? So maybe on the first side, if you didn't know what who everybody was initially, when you see somebody portrayed in a different light, you see somebody like LeBron James, if he is on the basketball court and doing um, his professional sports thing, maybe not gonna be the first person that you think of fully tattooed if he was just on the street as being a leader in his community, right? And starting a foundation that has fully funded um, the I Promise School uh, and doing things like that. When you see somebody in the center of the last photo, Shirley Chisholm, do you see um, a black woman who is at a party with her friends or do you see the first African-American woman to run for president? Same with Greta Thunberg, if you may have dismissed her or thought originally, hey, this is just a little kid. It could be a little bit of ageism in there of her also being Times Person of the Year in 2019 at just the age of 16, right? And then looking at AOC being the youngest congressperson to be elected. And at the time that she was sworn in, she was only 29 years old. What do these things mean, right? But first, I just want to introduce myself really quickly. So like I said, prime your mind for what we're going to be talking about. I'm Nizoni, I'm a leadership coach. I'm also an active duty Marine. I have been leading people for the past 14 years. And so it's not something that is just a passing fancy for me. I really am passionate about helping people reach their potential, being more confident in the workplace and really setting up to increase their value and their skill sets to be more effective leaders in our executive landscape today. 
So going forward right into what our context is, right? So I want to talk a little bit about the differences between prejudice, discrimination, and then what actual bias is. A prejudice is a preconceived opinion that's not based on reason or actual experience. We look at our first picture here, the gentleman that may or may not be confronting this lady on the bus about not wearing a mask during a time of a pandemic while leaving a gentleman in the background who probably looks a little bit more sick based on the stars and the flushed cheeks um, could be acting on prejudice so that there's a preconceived notion that she would be more disposed to being sick because of her demographic. Going into discrimination, it's the unjust treatment of different categories or people most commonly on the grounds of age, race, sex, or gender. And it's very clearly in our photo here, we see that a check in the box and yes for men and not so much for women, right? Which takes us into bias, which really builds off of these two notions of prejudice and discrimination. And prejudice is it being in favor or against one thing, person or group um, compared to another and usually not uh, on the grounds of uh, something that would be fair. So in this photo, we see probably some bias on both ends, right? If I'm being pulled over by the cops and I'm a person of color, would I be um, afraid as the driver of the car that the police officer is going to act a certain way towards me because of the color of my skin and vice versa? Is this cop feeling like he should be in more or less danger because of the color of the skin of the person that he's pulling over? And just remember, like throughout this, keep thinking about those questions I initially asked you. Do you have personal bias that you are carrying, something that you can identify kind of as we're talking about these things, or have you experienced anything where bias uh, came into play? So as we move on, we're gonna talk directly about unconscious bias. And this goes back a little bit into the theory of what leadership is uh, and some of the different things that make up how our mind works and why bias can be unconscious. And so it's a very knee-jerk reaction to sort of say, hey, I think you have a bias about this. And we as people probably think the best of ourselves and we want to say no like i'm not biased and the same thing you are starting to hear a lot more in society right now is like no i'm not racist i'm not prejudiced i'm not ageist misogynist sexist whatever it is without realizing that everybody is going to have an unconscious bias so something just to keep in mind having unconscious bias does not make you a bad person but if you are not willing to be aware of what's going on and try to combat those unconscious biases that's where it can become a problem, especially in a leadership landscape. The first thing I wanna talk about are gonna be schema. If you've never heard this term, schema is really in super layman's terms, how we categorize the world that we see around us. So this is really built and based off the way that you were raised, your culture, your traditions, your experiences, your household, any sort of way uh, that you were able to be influenced when you were becoming the person that you are today falls into these mental models or schema of how you see the world. So for example, let's talk about public speaking, right? Public speaking is long touted to be the number one fear of people basically everywhere. So if you are a young kid and you have had a bad experience with public speaking and you just tell yourself or other people have told you all your life, hey, public speaking is really scary. It's gonna be really hard for you. You have a bad experience with it. Now you have a schema or a mental model that says, I'm not good at public speaking and it's always gonna be something that I'm afraid of. Unless you are able to break that schema or attempt to shift that mental model that you already have, you're always gonna walk into a situation with that schema because that's how you categorize it and how you have grown into that mental model. Going into system one versus system two ways of thinking. So system one and system two, I want you to think of your brain as something that works fast and slow, right? So if I were to ask you something very simple of, hey, what's two plus two? You're probably gonna be able to answer me and say four right off the bat, right? That is system one thinking. So system two is gonna be a little bit of a slower process because if I'm asking you, hey, what's 117 times 25? Maybe if you're a savant, you'll be able to tell me, you know, what the answer is off the top of your head. Uh, but you're more than likely going to have to take a little bit of time to think about that. So I want you to do another exercise right here just to break. Uh, you have your piece of paper and I want you to put your pen in your dominant hand. So whatever that is, and then I want you to write your first name. Okay, 
You've probably done it. It was probably easy. You could probably do it with your eyes closed, right? All right, next. I want you to take your pen and why don't you put your pen in your non-dominant hand and I want you to write your name. I'll tell you, I do this in class and it's very funny because my students visibly are just distraught when they do this. So if I told you to do that, whether you actually did it or not, you probably had a reaction in your mind of like, whoa, uh, I don't want to do this. This might feel uncomfortable. Um, I'm not great at it. Some of you may be ambidextrous, so maybe it was just as easy for both sides. But for the vast majority, you're going to have a discomfort in using your non-dominant hand to do something very simple with your with something that you're not used to. So if your schema, your mental model has always told you, my right hand is my dominant hand, this is easy, uh, then that's what you're going to fall into. You're going to even have a different mindset about using your non-dominant hand. This falls into system one and system two because your system two is required to make you think more about writing your name, something very simple, with your non-dominant hand. Moving right along, I want to go back to our initial questions. So when I first asked you, hey, do you carry any biases? Does anybody want to be brave and put in the chat box something that they may have thought of? Okay, this one could be hard, right? Because a lot of times identifying our own biases is pretty difficult because it's hard for us, and this is psychologically, it's hard for us to see not the greatest things in ourselves. Um, does anybody have anything that they can think of just a subject or a topic that they feel like they've experienced bias in? Okay, bias in the workplace during job interviews because they don't look like my name. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good one, Jeremy. And it's it's very interesting that you bring up a name topic uh, because these sorts of things affect people every day that if you have never thought uh, or had somebody say to you, hey, you don't look like a Jeremy, then you would never think that this would be an issue that somebody deals with, right? And Having biases and even being aware of other people's biases affects people's behaviors, uh, which is very, very interesting. Um, and it's just a personal example, right? So my name is Nijoni, but my first name is Ashley. And my mom wanted to name me by Nijoni for my first name, but she was too afraid to do it because she wanted me to be able to get a job later in life. And she didn't want people to think that my name was too ethnic or too difficult to say, which some people still give me kind of grief that they can't say it, but... It's, it's just one of those things that has bled into the way that she thought at the time. And so she thought that Ashley being the number one name used in the year of 1988 and also her favorite character on The Young and the Restless was going to be like the greatest first name ever. Lo and behold, everybody's name is Ashley. Okay, so should I said in college I experienced as an athlete, I probably have the same bias towards individuals who weren't athletes. Okay, another good example. Uh, so if you're in a type of a group, right? So it's not, having bias isn't always going to be related towards race, gender, or sex, right? We talk about groups of people. So if you are doing something that I'm not doing, I may have a bias towards you or that group in particular. Bias in your accomplishments, okay. Absolutely. I think another good example of bias in the workplace, I see with people, um, especially with people of color, is wearing your natural versus uh, relaxer processed hair. Um, and I've received a lot of questions from people who don't understand what the difference is between having natural hair and having relaxer processed hair, especially as a black woman and people just not particularly understanding what the big deal is or what the issue is. So. It's very, especially in the military, it's very prevalent of something that black women specifically have to think about. And really not many other demographics uh, would have to kind of be conscious of, especially black men as well, I think face a lot of similar hair issues based on initial biases or snap judgments or schema or mental models that people have and make judgments on them based on them initially. 
Okay, so Michelle says, I need my children non-ethnic first names because I want them to be able to get a job and not be judged by their first names. Yeah, and that's, that's very interesting, again, because a lot of people have similar experiences with the same type of biases that are influencing their behavior. And people seem surprised that a Hispanic women can be in a leadership role. Absolutely, right? And we, I think what the time that we're in is giving us a very unique uh, chance to show that there are many more qualified people of color uh, to help other people break these mental models that they have made that maybe we don't belong in these spaces. That's a good point. Casual workplaces when everyone else can dress casual, people of color are often criticized as sloppy or unkempt. unkempt. Uh, absolutely. I think that I have seen this um, in the civilian side of just uh, or even just in the military, when we go places, usually we're in uniform. So people's schema or mental model view is very clean. Uh, your hair is slicked back in a bun. You're wearing all the same clothes. So that's how I think of you. But when you get into a casual setting and you're wearing what you would normally wear, sometimes people are shocked. And sometimes people, uh, once you don't fit this mold that they made of you in their mind, will think things like Jeremy just said, sloppy, unkempt, this isn't something that I would do or something that I would wear because that's not my mental model and they want to reject that. Lisa says, sometimes when I see a person wearing a turban on their head, I sometimes wonder if they're an extreme Muslim and wonder if I should be afraid. Okay, that's very fair, right? And thank you for sharing that um, because these are real things that we're thinking and these are real things that other people are thinking too. So if you're acknowledging these biases, you're already making the first step to combat these things, right? And that's that's an awesome point. And I think, uh, again, recently, we've seen a lot of coverage on, on where people's biases and prejudice lay, especially on different uh, demographics and not just Black people, not just Hispanics, but like you said, like the Muslims, um, and with religions that we don't understand. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, good. Body types in the military, slimmer equals fitter. Absolutely. That is an absolute bias that I think a lot of people carry, especially being a Marine. We do a terrible job at this because one of the things that we celebrate is being super fit. And can you run really fast on the physical fitness test? Or can you do a million pull-ups? And this just must obviously mean if you can do those things that you're going to be a great leader, right? And those two things don't always line up. And true, as you're right, body types in general, I think for the civilian side um, and people who are just in the workplace, if, if you look a different way, if somebody has a certain opinion about what body types should be in their mental model and their schema, they could accept or reject you right off the bat using their system one way of thinking. Michelle says, I've been on 11 leadership interviews in the last two years. The times that I wore my hair natural, I didn't get a call back. The times I straightened my hair, I got a second interview. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. And that is something, again, I think is very interesting for everyone to understand and why it's so important to talk about unconscious bias is because it affects so many different people. So even if I'm somebody that fits all the schema and all the mental models and I'm good to go, I'm the yes check in the box. It's gonna affect maybe somebody in your team and if you are not aware that these things can affect people that you are working with or a team that you're trying to build, then you're not gonna have the most effective team. Melissa says visible and invisible disabilities. This is another really great one, right? So there are many disabilities that you can't see. I don't know how many times I have seen people who have handicap placards and they don't look handicapped. And this is something I think that I have thought myself and would tag as my own bias of thinking like, hey, why do you have a handicap placard? You look perfectly fine. And I don't know how common that thought is and where I have had to come to a place of like, that's not the right way to think. Um, but it also, that's a good point for myself, I guess as well, because I'm like, I feel like I'm talking to myself here, but that's a good point of thinking that way and thinking almost following like, oh, that's actually not a good way to think about this situation, um, which just goes back to, hey, if you understand this is the way that you think and this is the way that you're leaning, you can combat those stereotypes and you can combat that way of thinking before you make any sort of action, right? Accents, accents, that's a really good one. Definitely 
for a bias. I don't know what it is about like British accents, uh, but I always feel like they sound, people with British accents sound so much more refined. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that makes them smarter. Maybe that makes them more worldly or something like that. But some accents are also, some accents are also not that, right? So not a positive schema, I would say, of what that means uh, for you. And some people have accents that are difficult to understand. And some people think that that automatically means this person may not be as smart as I am, or this person may not know as much as what they're talking about because I can't really understand them and their accent is difficult. This also, I think, plays into people who maybe are not native English speakers. There's a reason I have my phone slash white voice. Yeah, Jeremy, I've heard this from a lot of um, people of color who maybe have to do code switching, right? So you act a certain way when you're normal and around your family and people that understand your schema or your friends. Um, but when you're at work, you kind of have to put on a little bit of a mask in order to be accepted because people do carry these unconscious biases because uh, you don't fit into their mental models, right? Thank you for sharing that. Okay, great. Uh, that was actually really good for the discussion. I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about tips and ways, strategies for you to combat these biases, right? Because that's kind of one of the things that was a promise deliverable. So we'll go back to the slides. So I have six strategies for you of how to really combat these things. And going back to the, the things that you need, so to set the conditions to be able to start combating your unconscious bias, you sort of need four different things. You need the motivation to want to limit, eliminate the habits that you have already kind of maybe figured out or are starting to become more aware of. Uh, the second one is actually awareness of individuals, their vulnerabilities and how those different things manifest. Uh, strategies to address to these habits and then you have to have the effort to want to break these habits over time. So if we start with uh, the very first one here, detect, reflect, and reject. So if you detect the influence of stereotypes and biases, and I'll go back to uh, the handicap placard example, right? If I see somebody, they don't look like they're handicapped, and I immediately think like, oh, here's my stereotype that I'm placing or this bias that I'm placing on a person that I don't know, on a situation that I have no idea about, um, then you go into this reflect period, right? Where is the source or what are the effects of the stereotypes? that you're putting on somebody. So being a visible or an invisible disability, you're discounting somebody's experience or who they are based on whatever stereotype or bias I place on them because it looks like, they don't look like they're disabled. They don't look like they should have a handicap placard. And then the third thing is to reject that stereotype, right? So once I've kind of gone through this very quick um, loop of thinking of, hey, I am, exhibiting a bias, uh, the source of it is completely unfounded because it's based on the way that I, my mental model and what I think that they should look like, and I shouldn't think that way. The second thing here, so seeking individualizing information. So this really goes into team building and how do you work with people? You really have to focus on the details of what makes individuals individuals, right? So what makes a person a person and not grouping people all together. So going back to Chavez's example of athletes versus non-athletes, right? Do you actually know specific people or have you just placed them all in one group uh, without making them individuals in your mind? So once you do that, you can gain more information on those specific people before making any sort of decision on anything, right? So if I think I'm choosing someone for a new job and I'm trying to individualize them and gain more info about them, I say I have Michelle who's coming in for an interview and I don't really understand her hair because it looks maybe not as kept that I think it should be because it doesn't fit into my mental model. If you identify that, hey, I might be having a stereotype right here, and either A, you can just ask the person to tell you more about it, or you can do your own research and get more information about it and be proactive, right? Uh, and figure out, hey, where are these things coming from? Then you can make this a, more, a less of an unconscious bias or letting your biases come into play uh, during these uh, situations in this, these environments. It can also be done reactively, but at that point, you're probably 
going into crisis communication mode and something has gone wrong and you're trying to fix it. Uh, so I would really recommend trying to be proactive on all of these things rather than reactive. So our third thing here, uh, perspective taking. This one is super easy because it's all about empathy, right? And so being an empathetic leader is going to get you so far in life and in leadership, period. So are you able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see it from the perspective that they see it and not just your own? Our fourth one here, so situational explanation is going back to Agent J and our video who did amazing with it, right? Because he didn't make a system one judgment and start shooting all of the things that he thought were initially threats. But he really took the time to look at the situation and decide, hey, Tiffany actually looks like the biggest threat here and she's getting one right between the red and lights. So the fourth one here is fifth one here, excuse me, is to be committing to a standard. So if you are a supervisor, a manager, a leader of a team, and you are required to make evaluations, give feedback on people or rank people on your team, you need to commit to a standard or a rubric of how you're going to rate those individuals before the team shows up. You can't just be making these things on the fly because then you're going to have some unconscious biases that come in and you're going to think different things about different people after you meet them because your system one is going to start taking over. And then the last one here, just increasing your contact opportunities. If you're in the workplace or you have a team, especially if you don't really know them very well and you're still very much in the team building side of it, you're going to want to increase your contact opportunities with them, engage with them, sit with people you're not used to sitting with in a cafeteria, uh, make sure you're asking people about their experiences, get to know them on a personal level, and that way you're going to have a much broader view of who the person is individually and know that there are some things that could be explained by situations um, and not just a person and thinking that that's why they're behaving the way that they're behaving. And then really just our last tip here and a helpful acronym, especially for team building, making people feel included and really a part of teams and the cohesiveness uh, is this acronym of LIVE, right? And so these are just four ways to get your team really feeling like they are a part of your team and not just people that, that come to work and do what you say, right? So listening, making eye contact with your team, paying genuine attention, right? So another thing that we talk about in leadership very heavily is active listening um, and something that I highly recommend you looking into if you're kind of not sure what active listening is, but that really includes being engaged and into whatever the person you're asking for their input uh, and what they're saying in the moment and not interrupting, right? So interrupting, not interrupting really also goes into active listening, but eliminating some distractions from the outside. Um, including, so inviting people on your team to participate. If you're sitting in a group construct and you kind of have people that are quiet, um, there could be people that are more dominant in situations that are more type A and will always answer the question maybe call on somebody who isn't normally the speaker in a group because they could still have valuable input. They just may not feel like they have a space to talk or have, want to be the person that interjects uh, every time there's a question asked. So invite people to socialize as well. So say you're sitting in that cafeteria and you always sit with maybe the same people. So not just having you go to different groups, but inviting groups to blend themselves, right? And making sure everybody's kind of feeling like they can go in all spaces. Um, and making sure you keep people in the loop. Uh, communication is so, so important, but leaving people out if there's a communication loop can really make them feel not a part of the team. And it may seem obvious, but it's something that does happen. Make sure you're valuing your people, right? So give them credit when credit is due and make sure that you are A, knowing what their strengths are and then encouraging them in group settings or when you have projects to make them most effective for your team. Not only does this make them feel like they are valued as a person, but it makes your team better overall and you as a leader more able to wield something that's going to be a better product on the back end because you know what their strengths are and then you're making them feel like they have a place to really shine in whatever that job position is. And then acknowledging those accomplishments on the backside, right? So you should always be pushing the praise down to your team, even if you as the leader, the manager, the supervisor are getting sort of the outward credit from any bigger bosses that you have, always push the praise down and make sure 
that your team knows that you value them because you are highlighting the fact that they did something amazing. And making sure you're engaging with people. This one is so huge with me, especially being in the military. But make sure you say hello and goodbye to people. So often in society these days, we just walk past people or look at the ground or at my shoe or whatever is going on. Uh, and we're not really engaging very much, right? And so if you're in a team, you want to make sure that you're giving people equal time to give input and you're asking for that input as well. Because sometimes if you don't ask, you're never going to hear some really great ideas that could really contribute. Okay, I know that I've said a lot and we have really until 11.45 here for this. And this is the last slide that I have in terms of unconscious bias, like actual training. Um, let's see, Michelle, so just going back, Michelle said, I do get asked about my hair. Can I touch it? How often do you wash it? How long does it take? One time I wore Santa Glee's twists and a coworker told me I looked Jamaican and to speak in an accent like they do, bias at its best. Yeah, that's, they're, when it comes to biases, it's very, um, it's very difficult because people not only have the way that they think or their schema about it, but then they'll speak on it, which gives them lots of opportunity to say some really ignorant things. So James said, this also helps when you're engaging someone who has an unconscious bias themselves. I've used this countless times as a leader to engage, understand, empathize, and correct bias an individual has. Often they are white, and I'm attempting to change their frame of reference. Okay, great. Good. Okay, so I really just want to open up this last part for anything that you want to contribute uh, in the chat box of anything that this has made you think about any questions that you might have for me is something that maybe you didn't understand completely. Um, something that I do want to give you a frame of reference for though, especially with unconscious bias, usually unconscious bias training or trainings like this take hours, hours and hours, or even a span over a couple of days. So I'm giving you a very, very small snapshot of how to sort of see where you are coming from and tips and ways to combat your own unconscious bias, but it does take a lot of time. And like I said, in the, in the setting the conditions for how do you really change these habits, it's going to take effort, right? I wonder if you have any more advice on identifying your own bias so we can be better citizens. I think, I think that identifying bias is very difficult because, like I said, we're value attributing creatures by nature and we want to see the best in ourselves. So you have to do the hard work of really asking yourself the hard questions. What am I thinking when I see certain people? Am I thinking that way about the person with the handicap placard? Is this actually a bias, right? Um, thank you, Letty. Um, so it, I think it just comes down to personal work. Um, I think it helps me a lot when I talk to other people and kind of use them as a sounding board. Hey, this is a situation I experienced. What do you think about my reaction to it? Or this is what I thought when I saw this. What do you think about that? Uh, and that's usually a pretty good indicator. If this is like a trusted uh, person or individual that you're talking to, they're going to be a straight shooter and they're going to tell you like, hey, that's a little bit, that's a little bit off. Like the way you're thinking may be wrong. Um, so having trusted people that you can really confide in and help you push you in the personal growth realm can be really important. Does that answer your question, Jeremy? Okay, great. Awesome. Well, I hope I didn't talk too fast for anybody. Um, I do sort of carry that problem myself, but I really hope that this was just an opportunity for you to learn more about unconscious bias and actually what it is. Uh, and just to reemphasize, acknowledging that you have unconscious bias or figuring out what those biases might be does not make you a bad person. You are not a bad person because you have a system one way of thinking and because the way that your schema and your mental models are built and how you see the world and categorize things, it, it's not something that is a detriment. What's a detriment to your character is if you aren't taking steps to correct that or break habits that could be potentially harmful to the people that you work with or are working for.
I think I have about four more minutes left. So if anybody has, thanks Angela. If anybody has any other questions. Nice. Awesome, Michelle. I consider myself an intelligent person. I graduated with honors in high school and college, but I oftentimes have people surprised when I share information, what is probably above someone's knowledge, they dismiss me. And that I think from a, an assessment in, uh, right off the bat, that makes me think that they are carrying biases themselves, right? And thinking that you don't have a space or a platform or a background to speak on certain things. Um, but I think that that plays more towards the reason why we need more people like you, right? And wanting to be someone who is heard and someone who is not afraid to be heard or dismissed. Uh, I think oftentimes people of color in general feel like the exact same way or maybe you feel like they don't have a space to speak and so we're just quiet most of the time and we're very smart we have things to say um, we should be in arenas that are much higher than i think we are represented currently um, but it takes a lot of us to to step up and say hey i'm going to share these things um, that are valid thoughts and opinions and contributions and not be afraid of those biases or somebody dismissing us that's a good point thank you for sharing that Thank you, Lisa. Great, well, if you um, wanna contact me or learn more, um, you can always go to our website, sparkofthepopup.com. It's super easy. Um, also, follow me on Instagram at sparkofthepopup, also super easy. I respond to everything on all of those things. Um, if you ever have any other questions, there are definitely more resources. We have a newsletter that goes out monthly. Um, and if you just want to be more involved in anything leadership, just let me know and drop me a line. I'm always available. Trent says, I think this also carries over into our personal lives with friendships as well, being able to call close ones out on bias and being humble enough to expect it, to accept it when we're called out. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that that goes back into the trust factor um, and having people that are, that are going to do that for you. Spark the pop-up. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad that you all were able to attend. I know that there were some difficulties in the beginning. I'm glad that we were able to get all of the information in. Um, if you need anything from me or even more of this information, um, I'll definitely be sending hopefully this recording of the training out in the next newsletter. And I'm also going to be putting just a roll up of what the information was from the actual workshop in our next newsletter. So if you, maybe you didn't write it down fast enough, maybe it was too fast. Um, I will be putting that a summary in the next newsletter. So make sure that you swing by the website and sign up for our newsletter. I think it's going to cut out right at, 45 too. So thanks everybody for attending.